and hearty welcome to all on behalf of Marine Ecology Laboratory, President's University, Kolkata, and Aquafile for joining us the sixth talk of our monthly colloquium lecture series by Dr. Omit Sharkar from Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research. Now I would like to request Dr. Shumit Mondol, Assistant Professor, Department of Life Science, President of University of Kolkata, to introduce our honorable guest. So over to you, sir. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It is my indeed pleasure to welcome Dr. Amit Sarkar, Associate Research Scientist, Environment and Life Science Research Center, Kuwait Institute of for Science Scientific Research, Kuwait. His research area encompasses biogeochemical cycling of bioessential elements in ocean, susceptible to climate change and anthropogenic perturbation. He has obtained his PhD in marine biogeochemistry in 2013 from CSIR NIO Goa and MSc in marine science from Calcutta University 2004. He has many awards and achievements to his credits. He was awarded Young Scientist Award in 2013 by IB, IMBER Integrated Marine Biogeochemistry and Ecosystem Research Committee, Bergen, Norway. CSIR Senior Research Fellowship in 2009 by Government of India. He was participants of India's Lohafex Iron Fertilization Experiment in Southern Ocean during 2009. He has more than 700 days of sea experience, including four expeditions to Southern Ocean and Antarctic waters. He was an alumni of SOLAS Surface Ocean and Lower Atmospheric Studies. He was who was a project scientist B from 2013 to 2018 at Ocean Science Group, Southern Ocean, National Center for Polar and Ocean Research, NCPR, Goa, India. He was a visiting scientist to Max Planck Institute of Microbiology, Bremen, Germany in 2011, and also a visiting scholar to School of Art Sciences, Edinburgh University, Scotland in 2010. He has published more than 30 publications in SCI journals and books, and he has been serving as peer reviewer for the journals Biogeosciences, Marine Pollution Bulletin, Marine Biology Research, etc. And with this brief introduction, may I request Dr. Sarkar to give his today's talk titled Harshening Energy in the Oceanic Dead Zone Reductive <coughs> Nitrogen Transformation. Over to you, Dr. Sarkar. Uh, am I audible? So, yes, you are audible. Uh, let me. I just want to confirm that you can see my slides, right? Yes, it is open. You can start. Okay, uh, a very good morning to all, and <clears throat> I'm thankful to uh, the annual lab, the Friends University, and the Akrofile Association, I would say, uh, for inviting me to share my. Uh, my knowledge, which I gathered by uh, my, my research of uh, the past one and a half decades in oceanography. <clears throat> um, so let's begin. So today, uh, your, your I voice is to... a little bit breaking. Uh, okay. Uh, still, this problem or? Now, now it is better, but still not very clear. Well, uh, I don't know. There may be some uh, network uh, issues. 
Um, maybe it will be like this all through the talk. No, now know. it is okay. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, uh, so here I, I was. So I'm going to talk about uh, oxygen minimum zones in the oceans globally and the coastal deoxygenation is another problem which are actually termed as the dead zones literally uh, but not uh, scientifically that will come in the later stage of my presentation <clears throat> then i'll talk about energy sources in the absence of uh, oxygen and how nitrogen cycling occurs in this low oxygen water and uh, i'll give you some indian ocean perspective research that uh, we have been carry carrying out uh, quite time for now uh, so let me uh, tell you that why uh, you must be all knowing so uh, why we study nitrogen uh, as we know that is a structural element of amino acids and the nucleides and uh, it is it has many uh, oxidation states and uh, many species can be found in uh, in the ocean starting from the nitrate to uh, amines and the ammonia like that and so nitrogen is an essential uh, nutrients uh, for any life to build and uh, if you uh, like remember that what we studied in when we are uh, pretty young in school and all so we knew the photosynthesis is uh, just by a simple equation that 6CO2 plus 6H2 is, is the sugar and the oxygen that has been released. But it's not that simple. Uh, we need additional nutrients like uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus. Uh, and in case of ocean, and also particularly for the land, I will say silicates uh, for the diatoms uh, and the, for the bamboos on the land. We need iron. We need vitamins. So nitrogen acts as a very essential nutrient uh, in the ocean. And uh, there are two aspects of nitrogen. When we have a excess nitrogen uh, available in the ocean surface, and if you have that uh, accompanying other nutrients, the phytoplankton blooms like anything. And uh, this particular uh, thing is called the uh, ocean eutrophication, the sudden uh, growth of high phytoplanktons. And what happened is when this uh, phytoplankton dies in the surface and they sink down below the euphotic layer or the, the dark zone of the ocean where light cannot penetrate, where respiration is very high and uh, oxygen has been con com uh, consumed to decompose this organic matter. And in some places, this respiration rate is so high that oxygen is totally consumed and a traditional by a traditional method you cannot uh, measure this uh, oxygen and those areas are called the oxygen minimum zones which occupy around 10 percent of the surface area of the global ocean but its impact on the nitrogen cycling is huge which i will come in the later part of my presentation so where uh, the omgs are found is basically along the Eastern Tropical North Pacific, Eastern Tropical South Pacific, South Atlantic, and Northern Indian Ocean. These areas are the most productive areas in the world ocean. As you see here, uh, this is uh, my, on the down slide, it's, it's the uh, Pacific and the Atlantic, and you see the chlorophyll concentration is pretty high at this region. So what happened exactly here, it's, it's uh, also called as a eastern boundary upwelling system where there's a winds come from north and there's a displacement of the surface water due to a strong current, which also induce uh, Ekman pumping, uh, which caused the upwelling of the water from the below of the ocean, uh, which generally has a low oxygen to start with, but very high night. Uh, nutrients, then uh, it comes up and it's induced the productivity. And then in turn, as I told just uh, in my earlier slide, so when this phytoplankton dies and then sink, there's oxygen consumption also occurs in the uh, below the euphotic zone, which we also call sometimes mesopelagic region. And it forms the oxygen minimum zones. 
it's generally found uh, in between 200 meter to 1200 meter the depth range but it also varies from uh, one ocean to another there is some uh, different in the indian ocean system uh, unlike the pacific and atlantic which is the uh, eastern boundary of polling system in indian ocean particularly in the arabian sea we found the western boundary of polling the same what happened in the uh, Atlantic and Pacific, and same happened here. There is a upwelling of the nutrient along the Somalia and Omani coast, which, which induce the primary productivity. And also during, that happens particularly in the summer. And there is also the winter convection that also brings a lot of nutrient in this region. And the same story again, there is a phytoplankton productivity, high productivity, which in turn make an oxygen minimum zone in, in the mesopelagic region. But if you see the oxygen minimum zone in the Arabian Sea or the Northern Indian Ocean actually does not match with the region of higher productivity. The productivity is high towards the left, uh, but our OMZ in the Indian Ocean is on the right hand side. So what exactly happened is uh, this uh, is western region of the northern Arabian Sea is uh, very dynamic. So the ventilation is very high. So the oxygen exchange with the atmosphere is pretty higher. And also there is a, uh, so the weight of our oxygen has been consumed is basically it's also they can take up from the atmosphere and maintain the balance. So OMG is not very strong uh, along the western margin. And also there is a difference of uh, mineralization, like uh, this area are uh, iron and copper limited, uh, so which affect the respiration process as well in the below. So that's why uh, this OMG is geographically se separated from the uh, high productivity zone. So now if you think about the oxygen, we have uh, a disbalance between the ocean and the atmosphere. The atmosphere has almost uh, more than uh, 37,000 petamol. And so petamol, I mean 32 billion ton. So breathing in the atmosphere is easy. Uh, for an animal, like for a, for a human, a, an adult, we generally breathe four liter air to get one gram of oxygen. But in ocean or in the water, it's, it's different. So just to get that same amount of oxygen, a fish, it has to breathe 152 liter of water. So you can compare it's the full liter in the earth and 152 liter of the water. So to breathe that 152 liter of water, you need uh, high energy. So uh, what does uh, this high animal like uh, eukaryote does? They try to avoid oxygen minimum zones. Uh, you see on the right hand side on the top, this is the latest paper uh, by Long et al. 2019, and they uh, check the fraction of uh, species uh, uh, with uh, how they vary with the um, uh, oxygen con ambient oxygen concentration in the ONGs. And in a normal oxygen condition, they are all doing fine, but as the oxygen concentration drop, drops, drop down, all the uh, species, their numbers also drop down. And there's another interesting paper by Strama et al. in 2012, and uh, they, they tag a blue marlin, this uh, fish, the Macuro nigricans, and uh, they observe its uh, mean daily movement in the water column. And what happened in the OMZ, they prefer to stay always on the surface at around 100 meter. So they don't go below because there is uh, very low oxygen. And they go below they found, uh, yeah, it's traveled to below 500 meter in only there is a normal oxygen condition. So life in the OMZ is very sparse. You, uh, if without any uh, good uh, alternative mechanism, so all the animals, they, mainly the eukaryotes, they try to avoid this oxygen minimum zones. So uh, here I'm going to show you some of the life in the Arabian uh, COMC. Is it uh, really lifeless? But it's not. It's not really lifeless. Uh, 
so I had a chance to uh, dive in the Arabian Sea OMZ uh, in, back in 2008. And we are doing a project with uh, Jamstick in Japan. And uh, they bought a submersible, which is named and the Shinkai 6500. And it was, I think, back in October. And uh, I could uh, dive once. And these are the fun, funny cartoons uh, made by one of my peer, Dr. Greg Curry from Edinburgh. And, uh, he termed himself as Aquaman. Man, there's not uh, much of uh, uh, like uh, hype of Aquaman at that time because DC had now uh, launched this uh, series of movies. But later, when I told him, it's, it's uh, Aquaman is already famous from the uh, for the movies, so he termed, uh, he coined a new term. It's called the Aquanaut. As, as of like the astronauts are going to the space and we are going to the deep of the ocean, so we are the Aquanauts. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, literally, when I was diving down in the submersible and observing outside in the water column, and their life is really low, but uh, very less life, but it's not without life. So it, this is these are the, some pictures we had I have collected from the submersible, and, and these are actually pretty close to the bottom. And uh, I'm uh, not a pure biologist by training, so I, I exactly don't know the species are, but. There are quite a lot of uh, life there. It's a sea pain, a jellyfish, some worms, a shrimp, a fish. Uh, I don't know, it's a tumble of hair. <laughs> Something it looks like. Uh, we Some uh, crustaceans, which we tried to catch with the robotic arms, but we couldn't succeed. But we got some ophuroids. Uh, and at the first glance, I saw it's a UFO. Uh, sitting in the bottom of the ocean, but later we understand this is the experiment we're doing uh, to measure the uh, bottom water oxygen fluctuation. It's called the benthic lander, uh, uh, equipped with many sensors, and a fish was passing by to that. So, how this life this survives in this ocean? So, these are the main theories by Dr. Lisa Levin from Scripps, USA. Uh, so they have very lower metabolic demands. They go for anaerobic, met anaerobic metabolisms. Uh, they perform chemosynthesis. And they do symbiosis, like endosymbiotic uh, relationship with some sulf uh, sulfur oxidizing bacteria or the episymbiotic relationship. They also uh, try to live inside the uh, sediment. They try to make their own uh, micro niche for their survi uh, survival. Uh, I just remember one thing like uh, Dr. Lisa had mentioned, they found a lot of polychaetes. They were gutless, so they don't feed. Uh, they don't have uh, this uh, intestinal system, so they completely depend on the symbiosis with the bacteria or the prokaryotes that actually flourish in these uh, oxygen minimum zones. Now, uh, when I talk about prokaryotes, and if you see the world's uh, evolution. The life has begun 4.5 billion years ago on this earth. But oxygen came later. It came around 2.5 billion years. So life was sustaining on the earth in the absence of oxygen for almost 2 billion years. So how they're, uh, like, what are the sources of electron acceptors to get the energy at, at that 2 billion years? <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, how respiration occur is, uh, so we need oxygen to burn the food to get energy. And uh, when we take oxygen, <clears throat> we produce around 402 kilojoule uh, energy. Uh, in oxygen based respiration. <clears throat> but there are numbers of electron acceptors are available in the water, which the prokaryote, mainly the microbes, were using in the starting of the earth evolution. And those are like nitrate, iodate, sulfate. There are manganese oxides, iron oxides, and the CO2 itself, which uh, produce a methane thing, or the fermentation process, you can say. So 
when the microbes use the nitrate as an electron acceptor, this uh, nitrate has been converted to N2 by a process called the denitrification. So uh, these are the uh, alternative respiration process in the oxygen minimum zones. And if you uh, see like the energy yield, so when uh, we the microbes use nitrate by denitrification, it's the energy yield is almost similar to uh, to, uh, compared to the oxygen respiration. So nitrate is the most preferred uh, alternative oxidant for organic matter in the OMCs. And then comes the manganese, iodate, iron, sulfate, and the in methanogenesis, as I told you. <clears throat> so, uh, so these OMG oxygen minimum zones that I just showed you, they are they they call the perennial. They are the permanent oxygen minimum zones in the global ocean. In addition to that, there are several hundred coastal localized oxygen minimum zones, or they call as the dead zones, all over the world. It has a adverse effect of fisheries because uh, it it's the results of uh, anthropogenic nitrogen input in the coastal areas which in turn uh, make the coast eutrophied, eutrophied and there are the toxic blooms occurs. It's, uh, you, you, if you see the paper, there are many news comes from China, the huge, huge blooms. And there's a loss of economy uh, due to those blooms and the fish mortality. And these are the hotspots for the greenhouse gases like N2 and methane. Which, which greenhouse potential compared to CO2 is 100 to 1,000 times higher. So as I'm telling you how uh, these localized dead zones are formed, and the credit goes to this three gentlemen. You uh, heard of Haber and Bosch process. This was invented in 1905, where they showed how ammonia, uh, sorry, nitrogen and hydrogen can be bound together to produce the ammonia. And Norman Borlaug is the pioneer of green revolution in the 1940s, where this Heverbush ammonia has been used largely in the fertilizer and used in the, in the agricultural sector. And there's a saying, the great saying that nothing first enters the life of mortals without a curse. So what is the fate of this Heberbush uh, ammonia? There's a production, as I was telling that there's a huge production of Heberbush ammonia, you can see from 1940s to there's a data from till 2015. Uh, a little bit uh, high and, uh, and low, but it's the completely increasing trend. And uh, developed and also developing countries, their uh, the production is pretty high. This is from report from 2017-18, and we are here, uh, India. We are less, uh, very low compared to China, but uh, we are pretty similar compared to uh, U.S. and Russia. <clears throat> and this is uh, the synthetic uh, fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer use uh, usage in the coastal state like Goa and Karnataka. What I was studying in back in uh, yeah 2008 10 starting from, and there's an increasing trend of fertilizer in the agricultural sector. So, when this nitrogen fertilizer has been produced by Heberbush process and the nitrogen that we consume, there are many steps. So the fertilizer has been produced. The fertilizer is used consumed by the agriculture. Then this nitrogen is transferred to the core, then harvested, then it's converted to the food, and then food we consume. And at every step, there is a loss of nitrogen. It has been estimated that 40%, 14% of nitrogen that has been produced in Heberbush process that enters the human mouth if you're a vegetarian. And it's only 4% for a non-vegetarian. So it's totaling to 18% and 82% basically lost into the environment. So from this agricultural sector, 
they make their way this 82 percent of nitrogen in through groundwater aquifers through streams through rivers and they finally ends at the sea which caused the coastal eutrophication and forms these oceanic dead zones also if you see and and the dead zones means there is huge denitrification is occurring and is altering the nitrogen cycling if you compare uh, the present climate change scenario uh, which has started from the industrial revolution thin since the 1700 century and it took more than 100 years to alter this global carbon cycle but it just took like less than 50 years to change the nitrogen cycling uh, starting from the Green Revolution in 1940. So this is uh, what we knew about, or what we all read about the nitrogen cycling in the OMZs particularly. So we, we all know about the nitrification, nitrogen fixation, this assimilation, and the only one process where nitrate has been used as an electron acceptor is the denitrification. So what is a sequen denitrification is a sequential pathway. So where nitrate convert to nitrite, then nitrous oxides, uh, and then gaseous nitrogen. So nitrous oxides and nitrogen, since they're the gaseous product, they escapes from the system. So we basically in the OMG, we, we lose the nitrogen. So that's why we call this a uh, reductive transformation. So till uh, early, early of this century, it was estimated that denitrification is responsible for 50% of oceanic fixed nitrogen loss. So if ocean lose nitrogen, uh, if, if you think the big picture, like then upwelling water will have less, less nitrogen later because this happening in the mesopelagic zone. So it will affect the future productivity of the ocean also and the carbon dioxide sequestration. <clears throat> so also you can see on the right plot, I have shown the, this N2 that has been produced from the denitrification is really high in the OMZs. So, but there is some glitch. If we, uh, if you see the denitrification equation, this is the organic matter. And then nitrate has been used to respire this organic matter. And the product is carbon dioxide, ammonia, and gaseous nitrogen end product. And we other, uh, along with water and the uh, phosphorus, some of the phosphates. Now, few of the OMZs, it has been recorded that, so if denitrification occurring, there should be a product of ammonia. So the few of the OMZs, is there is no ammonia presence. So what is happening here? The, where, the, where are the all ammonia gone? This was bugging the scientists and it happens like uh, not uh, very, not in very past, like it's very recently, it's 2005, 2003 to 2005 during this time. So there's another pathway. This was first was found in the lab in Netherlands. It's called the anamox or the anaerobic ammonia oxidation. So where the subspatial microbes, which culturing them is really difficult and uh, we generally depends on uh, either sequencing or a technique like uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization so these microbes, called anamox bacteria, they can combine the ammonia and the nitrite that has been produced from the denitrification and they release as nitrogen. So if you see there, uh, the pathway breakdown, they produce hydrogen as an intermediate reductant for their metabolism. This fuel, hydrogen is used as a fuel in the rockets. So you can imagine energetically how efficient these bacteria are. They are harnessing energy in the OMZs. So then the scientist community who has the interest in the OMZs, they all started uh, 
doing more research and try to find these anamox bacteria in the oxygen minimum zones. So there's a big conflict, and they found it in the, uh, in the Chile, uh, Chile uh, the South Af South American coast. They found in Peru. There's some report from the Somalia and Oman Omani shelf. And there's a big debate. So that which process dominates in the ocean for the nitrogen loss? Is it the anamox or is it the denitrifications? So this is how the nitrogen cycling is looks in after 2005. There's a new pathways has been uh, incorporated like anamox, just what I told you. There is another pathway called DNRA. It's a disseminatory nitrate reduction to ammonia, where these occur outside of the cell. They don't uh, take up this ammonia for the organism growth. They and also. Uh, as the denitrification has the many step, there are many enzymes involved. And is there any lack of enzyme? So denitrification may stop in between. So another pathway that I have not uh, shown in this uh, in this cycle. Uh, so there is it also happened like there will be only nitrate reduction to nitrite in the ocean. And nitrate is one of the uh, toxic so byproduct. As you heard, the blue baby uh, disease, or the premature baby, uh, they born is a blue color. This is the toxicity of the nitrite. So, addition to that uh, oxygen minimum zone, the permanent and the perennial that I mentioned in the Arabian Sea, we have another additional coastal dead zones along the western coast of India. This is seasonal. If you see the oxygen panel here uh, in the orange color, so this oxygen deficiencies start during June or early June, and it's uh, staying till September to early October. This is the region where there is a high, very high nitrous oxide production. And also towards the end, like in September, October, this water turned completely sulfidic. So there is no oxygen. And also during this time, all nitrate has been consumed. You don't see any nitrogen in the water column. But we see some of the ammonia developed development over here. So from the presence of ammonia, it may come from uh, two uh, options, like either denitrification product or maybe the DNRA, as I told, the simulatory nitrate reduction to ammonia. Uh, so my peers, some of my peers from NIO Goa, uh, they were trying to identify the pathways, uh, in-loss or reductive pathways in this coastal system, seasonal coastal system. And uh, they found the denitrification is the, is the key process. So this data was published in 2003 by Nike. And, uh, uh, and then American scientists dual. And their also experiment was uh, they done in uh, 2004. So when uh, actually these experiments was carried out, uh, the scientists didn't know about the anamox process or the other process. So they could not uh, do it. So they could not identify or the technology was not, uh, not enough that time uh, to identify or the you know, the dissect among the multiple process that occur. So this is uh, the project, uh, my PhD project I took up uh, in NIO. And we applied uh, some isotopic technique. Uh, we labeled the substrate isotopically and we measured the product. Uh, and, and the product differs uh, from each process. So I'm not going into detail of that, but what we found that we found uh, all these processes in the western, along the western uh, coastal, western continental shelf of India. And, uh, but yes, uh, uh, denitrification was the dominant process and it's responsible from four to almost uh, 11 teragram of nitrogen loss along this coast. Whereas anamox was only uh, 0.1. To 0.2 uh, teragram nitrogen loss from this system. 
DNA we it was very inconsistent and uh, the rates were fairly low. And this data we just published very recently. But there's another twist in the story. So this is the work we are doing uh, of Goa, a time series experiments, where we saw the H2S build up with time in the bottom water. And when you compare with the nitrous oxide data, we just saw the nitrous oxide was building just above the sulfidic layer. So there is something is happening between the sulfate reduction and the nitrate reduction. So here uh, I introduce you another pathway for harnessing energy for the microbes by chemolith autotrophy and it's termed the cryptic sulfur cycle uh, by Dr. Canfield in back in 2010. So this nitrate, uh, so this bacteria, mainly alpha, beta, gamma, and epsilon, proteobacter, thiobacillus, bigator, etc. They can make their own food using H2S sulfides and the nitrate. And the energy is extremely high compared to the normal denitrification and oxycrystallization. You can see it's 1,260 kilojoules. So we modified our experiment. We started uh, adding additional sulfides, and we saw indeed this. This is only with nitrite, and you can see the difference in the y uh, axis. It's two micromole, and this is 0.3. So H2S or the sulfide was actually. Uh, contributing to the denitrification or is that it's called as a chemolitho autotrophic denitrification. And in, back in 2011, we along the coast we measured and compared both the normal classical heterotrophic denitrification and the chemolitho autotrophic. And we saw like in the southern part like Calicut, Carver, Mangalore, those side where the sulfides were available, the autotrophic denitrification was much higher compared to the blue, uh, the normal denitrifications. Now, uh, I take you back to our measurements. The total nitrogen loss from this west coast is totaling the gland, if we add up the denitrification and the anamox, it comes around 4 into 10 to the power 6 tons from the coast. But the usage of Stop nitrogen feet. fertilizer in Indian subcontinent, it's 12. So it's a one third that has been lost from the coast. And fertilizers are not only the source. There, there are sources like atmospheric dust deposition. There could be a groundwater fluxes. So there are other sources of nitrogen also. And as we saw that all nitrogen has been removed as the system turns sulfidic. So, so there is a disbalance between like our, so uh, the usage when it's 12 and 20 to 6 and 82% it's if it enters into the ocean, so it should be like almost 10 to into 10 to the 6 tons, but we are reviewing only four. So where the other or where the other nitrogen is gone, how they are lost. You also see like in the uh, reported nitrate level in the Zuari and Ganga is not very high. It's only 10 micromole and 8 micromole like that. If you compare to the one of the polluted river, few of the polluted river around the globe, like in China, we have uh, 50, more than 50, 42 like that, who's fairly less in our river in, in, in India. So there must be some nitrogen loss system in the land itself. So keeping this hypothesis in mind, we have started surveying lake reservoirs and groundwater all over the India, starting from south in Idiki to Himachal, from Kerala to Himachal, and also like from uh, east to west some of them UP and then Gujarat. 
and not only lake and reservoirs we uh, used to uh, bore and take out groundwater when this uh, uh, manpower and uh, additional things are uh, available uh, this was our first uh, step we collect water and check if there is a nitrite which is a intermediate of denitrification and then we identify the site of nitrogen loss uh, that is happening so uh, these are the results from uh, Tilari Reservoir. It's very close to Goa. It's basically uh, situated in the border of Goa and Maharashtra. It's a, a monomictic, uh, or sorry, dimictic uh, reservoir, a dam. It was very close to uh, Inayo. Uh, it's like uh, three to four hours drive. So we, we could uh, study this uh, system uh, in a monthly basis, almost in a monthly basis. And uh, the first report of the methane and N2O from Tilari and also from the other all of, uh, dams and reservoirs from all over the India, what we found, there is not much emission of methane and N2O from these uh, systems. So uh, this is my colleague uh, Gayatri. She published these results back in 2013 and when uh, she's uh, compared hard data with the other tropical uh, countries. And uh, we are basically uh, doing very fine. Our, uh, this dam and reservoirs are pretty, pretty green. We are not emitting much of uh, radi radi radiatively force, uh, like uh, radiatively active uh, gases like methane and N2O, unlike other uh, countries. So the most fascinating part over here, if you see, when there is a methane buildup in the oxygen, low oxygen water, we don't see any nitrous oxides. When there is no methane, we see some of the nitrous oxide production. This is extremely fascinating and what's happening there. So now I take you, I tell you the, another pathway to harness energy by the procure, the microbes. It's called the anaerobic methane oxidation. The nitrate that reacts with the methane and produce nitrogen gas that has been lost from the system. And in this pathway, there is no nitrous oxide production. That's why we don't see any N2O in the presence of methane in the reservoir system. This paper we published very recently, uh, lead by my PhD guy, Dr. Nagbe in 2008 in Nature Communication. Uh, so we, amends our samples with some methane and we indeed saw uh, very high nitrogen productions uh, in these samples. Uh, so I, I came almost towards the end of my presentation. Uh, so what is happening to these OMGs in current scenario or how the climate change is impacting this, these areas of the oceans? The OMZs are expanding. So we are losing more oxygen now compared to other. In fact, ocean has already lost over 2%, around 4.8 petamol of uh, oxygen. This, this estimate came very recently last year by IUCN. As I told at the, at the beginning that it's for the higher in eukaryote and uh, animals who lives in the ocean they the energetically it's very costly to take one gram of oxygen from the water so if we lose uh, the oxygen this this way it's gonna be a very suffocative condition for them and the coastal dangers numbers are increasing very rapidly it's not only fertilizer but also the uh, the disposal of untreated sewage, mainly the domestic sewage, which contain a lot of nitrogens. These are the four pictures uh, for four events. Uh, well, my short tenure in Kuwait for the last two years, I had clicked. So you can see these are, uh, I have experienced here and uh, the fish mortality. This is the sea cucumber death. And this is just two months ago a region where there's a 
like in kilometers there's a mass mortality of the molars and this is the effect of uh, unmanaged dip uh, disposal of uh, sewage in the ocean so ocean desoxygenation is perhaps the ultimate wake up call on how ignoring the ocean jeopardizes the interest of us all that is the uh, they said in the iocn report but it's going to be very bad for the future generations if we don't act now uh this is uh, the two of uh, my uh, one is my dr nagbe is my phd guide and dr professor smetachek who shaped my career and who actually uh, uh acted as a catalyst to take up biogeochemistry and ecosystem functioning as a career uh what dr uh, smetachek said that we human are extremely selfish i always remember uh these words from him we are so selfish that this planet where we have 75% of water we should call it water not the earth and you see how selfish we are we are just destroying everything in the nature and when and professor nagbi says one thing like uh, he says we basically lives on domestic sewage you know the the way the urbanization is happening the population is growing and where our septic tank are leaking they are just adding up more anthropogenic nutrients into the groundwater system so yeah so this is really bad but there are some good news as well for uh, young uh, researchers like you it's that uh, United Nations is going to announce 2021 to 2030 this <coughs> 10 years is going to be the decade of oceans so there we are worldwide we can expect a worldwide boom in oceanographic research more and more uh, so i just uh, at the end i want to say be uh, be like very really take care of the environment we live in and like if we are studying uh, the marine system we have to take care <laughs> of it so that's it with this i would like to in my talk today uh, thank you very much for listening again uh, thank you for inviting and it's uh, the aquafile and the marine ecology laboratory you guys are really rock you guys are really doing Uh, really well uh, to motivate the young people to understand the ocean thank you very much thank you amit for such a nice talk and uh, uh, as far i know amit uh, and his group is uh, one of the pioneer in uh, this uh, biogeochemistry research obviously everyone knows dr nagbi and his group and uh, he these group are fortunate enough to collect samples in the submersible uh, automation automated uh, machines and going deep into the uh, omz zone so this is a incredible experience by them uh, this group i have one question on it uh, is this yeah. uh, uh, the omz uh, this uh, option uh, oxygen minimum zone it is uh, is there any phenomenal uh, seasonal phenomenal is there or it is uh, throughout the Uh, year it is the same persistent uh, so the perennial oems is that uh, what i showed at the beginning the globally they are permanent there is not much change okay uh, but but some of the coastal are seasonal for an example like in our western coast of india it's seasonal it happens during only summer monsoon and in the winter in it again is mixed up so uh, okay. so formation of uh, Uh, OMZ, there are many factor like the stratification should be strong. Uh, so what happened in west, particularly in west coast, coast of India, we know we like Goa receives a, a, a huge rainfall. The west coast, you can say, so there is the rainfall occurs in the foothills of the Western Ghats, and all the water they they comes into the sea, and so 
actually if you see the salinity is is very low during the summer time so the stratification is very strong so the mm -hmm. oxygen exchange with the atmosphere it's uh, affected so that's why uh, uh, so it so says a lot so the, so according to you what is the main reason of this uh, stratification and the, that omz zones are increasing in, is it due to the global uh, warming and or the synergistic effect of global warming and ocean acidification yeah it, it's the both it's the both it's uh, so as we're heating up you see, see the diffuse uh, the gas gases law of diffusibility so you know warm water you can hold less mm. gases when it is cold and it's you can hold more gases so mm. as the ocean is warming so we are losing more oxygen and also it's there is an anthropogenic uh, mainly along the coast with an anthropogenic effect mm -hmm. okay thank you amit for such a nice talk and uh, as we, he pointed out that amin ticket will be for blue economy or ocean study so youngster yeah. may opt this uh, oceanographic study as for their future career so now i hand over to, to monita ghosh research scholar marine ecology laboratory for taking up the question and session Thank you, Dr. Shankar, for the elaborative presentation within a very short span of time. Your talk really gives an overall glimpse of uh, your research efforts in the field of uh, OMZ and also dead zone. How does it affect the nitrogen cycling and the life of the oceans? So thank you for sharing your journey with us. And I'm sure our participants have also thoroughly enjoyed your talk. So we would like to thank from bottom of our hearts for accepting our invitation, sharing your precious time and experience with us from your very busy schedule. So it is, it now, is a privilege. Thank you very much. So now let's move on to question and session. Uh, our first question is from Dr. Partho Sharuti Chakraborty. Uh, he is asking, is there any delta G value for methane oxidation by nitrate? And uh, why does it fall in the redox series? Ah, okay. So, yeah, it is. It is there. I think it is around uh, seven hundred something. I I cannot recall uh, exactly right now. So this is an independent pathway. This is the I think this is the autotrophic pathway basically. So uh, they just oxidize the methane and to extract the oxygen from there. So. Mm. Uh, it is very difficult to say where it is fall in the redox series if we see like uh, this is not a conventional conventional pathway so we really cannot uh, put it uh, here but or not i'm not the expert in that to say comment of that yeah uh, by the way i'll look into it for sure thanks thanks for the question yeah. thank you sir Next question is from Shovik Shorkar. Um, he is asking uh, that does nitrogen rise or lower the pH of seawater? Uh, no, uh, not really, uh, not instantly. Uh, but if you see like uh, it's faint. So nitrogen is a gas, you know, and uh, uh, so there could be a consequence like nitrogen has been as uh, like uptaken by the phytoplankton and then it's in goes into the organic matter then when this organic matter they broke and released they may produce some acid and lower the pH but that is not much so direct nitrogen immediately no they don't change the seawater pH thank question is from uh, Vashkar Karmukar. Uh, can you please explain the part what is the fate of nitrogen loss? Yeah, so if ocean loses nitrogen, the productivity is going to change. Actually, it's already happening. Uh, last week we had a meeting and uh, so uh, you know the Mainly in the Arabian Sea, if you compare the Bay of Bengal, so the Arabian Sea is there, these nitrogen losses processes are active. So uh, the nitrogen fixes in process uh, by the cyanobacteria is high. So uh, the normal phytoplankton population actually is taking over by the cyanobacteria because they can fix the nitrogen from the atmosphere. So 
once the ocean lose more nitrogen it's going to affect the primary productivity it going to change the ecosystem functioning is going to change the biodiversity uh, yeah that's is going to happen in the long run thank you sir jenny fernandez is asking uh, is there a similar trend observed in the bay of bengal omz coastal or open ocean uh, no, uh, no, Geneva, it's not uh, happening because, uh, you know, there the a recent paper by Bisto in uh, 2017 and most recently in 2020 by Caroline Lusher. Uh, Bay of Bengal OMZ, they act completely differently compared to Arabian Sea. Because in Bay of Bengal, there's a huge uh, mineral uh, input through the uh, rivers because, you know, it's very turbid. So, uh, the productivity is very low and it's not denitrifying yet. So denitrification has not been reported because there's a unavailability of uh, substrate in the Bay of Bengal OMZ. And coastal OMZs, uh, there is a report by Professor Sharma. Uh, they have found a small OMZ system uh, in the coastal uh, Bay of Bengal, but uh, there is no report of uh, any nitrogen loss or denitrification that is happening in the Bay of Bengal. Not yet. Okay, so that's all from our live chat box. Uh, now I have one question. You have mentioned the anamox yeah. pathway. So in yeah. that pathway, an intermediate product called hydrazine is produced. So, yes, um, yes. can you please tell me that is there any impact of hydrogen upon marine organisms? Hydrogen as a compound is very toxic, but is okay. this is an intercellular function. So, if they are not releasing the hydrogen, they produce hydrogen to, you know, to get uh, uses as a reductant for the energy. So, I have not heard anything about hydrogen pollution. If could be happen like an industrial. Uh, leakage somewhere very really locally but not from the anamox process no there is no adverse effect from the anamox effect in the system my hydrogen okay thank you thank you dr sharkar for your elaborative answers and many thanks once again for joining us today it's a great pleasure to have with us today thank you very much and thank you everyone for participating in today's lecture and stay tuned for the future updates Okay, have a good day.